All right, welcome everyone. Welcome back to our second lecture, uh, BC213. We're just giving a quick overview of um, Revelation. We are in Revelation chapter 13. So, Revelation 13, what we are seeing is there's a beast who is empowered by the dragon, that's the devil. And this beast is speaking, you know, verse 5, Revelation 13, 5. He's speaking blasphemous things, he's, and he will continue for 42 months. And, you know, if we cross-reference this with what Daniel wrote in Daniel chapter 7 uh, and 8, which we will do in, in our third year when we study Daniel and Revelation, we will see that this is exactly, this was exactly described by Daniel, these things, or what this man will do. You know, he refers to him as a little horn in Daniel. And this is exactly what that person will do. So, you know, we can see the fulfillment of uh, Daniel's prophecy here. And this man is speaking blasphemy against God, uh, against God's tabernacle, that's a temple. Um, uh, and uh, he's making war with the saints. So he's attacking the saints. Uh, and he's doing this. Then, verse 11 onwards, it says, I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. So there's another beast, another person who's demonically empowered. Okay, so these two, the Antichrist and the false prophet, they're people, but they're empowered by Satan. Right? And this man, looks like a lamb and speaks like a dragon so uh if you you know if you just go over to um chapter 20 or chapter 19 and uh, verse 20 revelation 19 20 when the lord jesus comes it says, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So the second beast is called false prophet. Revelation 19, 20. Okay, so uh, we'll come back to chapter 13. So the second beast is actually called a false prophet because... He's going to be a promoter of a religion. He's going to work signs and wonders. And his main thing is worship the beast. So his religion is worship the beast. Right? So they are working together. The Antichrist and the false prophet. They are working together. This false prophet, he's like a lamb. It means, you know, like copy of Jesus, but different. He's speaking like a dragon. He's preaching. He's speaking all these things. And he's given authority. And what was his main thing? He causes, I'm back in Revelation 13 verse 12, he causes the earth and those who dwell in to worship the first beast. So the main thing is worship the first beast. So he's creating a religion that is going to cause people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. And right? And it says, verse 13, Revelation 13, 13, he performs great signs. He makes fire come down from heaven. He deceives those who dwell on earth. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast. And uh, verse 15, he was granted power to give breath to the image. And the image of the beast will speak and cause many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. That's interesting. He's, make, he's telling people to make an image of the beast. This image of the beast can speak. And uh, if you don't worship the image of the beast, you will be killed. How is this going possible? And again, I'm using my imagination here. Uh, in some parts of the world, and you'll find this on, online as well, in some places, they have robots as saints. 
So meaning, uh, see now some some the places you go, you will see a shrine, you'll see a statue of a saint. But now instead of putting a physical statue, they have a robot, and that will speak to them. So they go to worship, and this robot is speaking. So it's as though it's not real. They know everybody knows it's not real, but it is as though this this image. He's talking. He's talking nice things only. He's been programmed to talk nice things, right? So they're replacing a statue with a robot that can speak things. Obviously, they, if they want, they can they can create this stat this robot to even shoot them down. <laughs> right. But it's, it's real. It's not imaginary. It's it's being done now in some parts of the world. They have this. So I'm just imagining. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying. So when it says here, you're causing many to worship the image of the beast, and if you don't worship it, you'll be killed. I can imagine how this can be done today. Right? You can have an image that can speak, and it can even do harm. It can be programmed to do those things. Right? So, verse 16. He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on the right hand or on their forehead, and that no one might buy and sell except who has a mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And verse 18, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So there is something here. I mean, what's, what, what's the essence of what's happening here is this. There is the beast who is the Antichrist. There is the false prophet. The false prophet is promoting what we refer to as a, a, a global religion, a one world religion. And this religion is to cause people to worship the beast, the Antichrist. And at this time, there is also a, an economic system, a financial system that's introduced where you have to have the number of the beast, the number of this Antichrist. So some association with him. Right? Some saying that I, I accept this thing. And you can only and you can buy and sell only if you have the number of the beast on you. Right? That means there is a global religious system and a global economic system that's been put in put in place at this time. Right? And again, this is something that can happen today, uh, where a system can be introduced globally, where you buy and sell only if you have a certain mark or a certain ID. You know. It's possible. And if you think about it, literally maybe 20 years ago, before you know credit cards were introduced and global transactions could take place, before that, it was not even, you can't think of it, that, hey, people all over the world could be controlled by something like this. But today, with financial systems so interconnected and things that can be done online you can imagine that yeah something like this can happen that one man could introduce a system where you cannot buy or sell unless you have that particular mark or identification you can control systems it's possible right so the technology to make this happen is possible right um, two things we are seeing, uh, a religion, a global religious system, and a global economic system being introduced by the false prophet, by the Antichrist, and they're working together. And this is starting from the middle of the tribulation till the end of the tribulation. Chapter 14, scene changes. The scene is now in heaven. So somewhere, Right after the middle of the tribulation, 
the 144,000 Jews are in heaven and they're worshiping God. So the question that, that, that many have tried to answer is, how did these 144,000 Jews get to heaven? Because they are there in the, before the throne of God, they are worshiping God. Then we can say, okay, it's only going to be one of, I mean, it could be, what are the possible options? One, maybe they were all killed and their souls are coming up to heaven. Or maybe they were all raptured and taken up to heaven. So the only clue we have is they are the first fruits. So uh, the 144,000 Jews, uh, they, uh, these, they follow the Lamb wherever he, this is in Revelation 14, verse 4. They are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. These were redeemed from among men. This is verse 4. Revelation 14, 4. Being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in the mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So this is the only clue we have. How did these 144,000 Jews who were marked by God on the earth now in heaven? So they were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God. And to the Lamb. So the word first fruits, right, that's what we have to look at. Okay, first fruits, well, how is it used? Um, so you look in, in like, for example, in James, he talks about being uh, that th these believers were first fruits. You know, you can just look at that. Uh, the first ones who got saved. <coughs> Okay. Uh, verse 18, James 1, 18. James is writing. He says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So he's saying, okay, we were born again. That's what he's referring to. Uh, we were born again by, his, by the word of truth. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It means the, the early people, the first set of people who got saved. Okay. And James is writing to uh, Jewish Christians, Jewish believers who've been scattered after the persecution that rose in Jerusalem. They've been scattered. Out of Jerusalem. So they're all outside. But they became believers while they were in Jerusalem. So he's saying, we were born again. We were all born again. And we were kind, became like the kind of first fruits. Meaning the first, the first fruits like the first set of harvest that comes. But in this context, James 1.18 is the context of them being born again. Right? So the idea of first fruits, it's like the first harvest, right? Um, who are redeemed from among men, going back to Revelation 13 and verse 4, from among men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. How do we understand it? And so uh, it's not very clear, but we can, we can you know, make some intelligent uh, deductions or say that most likely, these Jewish people were raptured, but taken up to God. And uh, the reason he's saying they were among the first fruits, meaning the first set of people who believed in Jesus from the Jewish community, from the people of Israel, who have been taken up to God from out of the tribulation taken up, raptured. Because we already know that there must have been a lot of other Jews 
who believed in Jesus who have been killed. So, for example, we saw in Revelation 12, uh, 17, the dragon is going to make war with the rest of our offspring. That's the Jewish people who keep the commandment of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Right? That means he's going after them. He's persecuting them. Many of them will be killed, will die. They go up. But what's the difference between them and these 144,000 Jews? So it's like these 144,000 Jews have been preserved. They, they start from the early part of the tribulation. They go across after the middle of the tribulation. And then they are raptured. If you say they are raptured, then that makes them a kind of first fruits. If you say they all died, they were all killed, then it's like everybody else who was killed during the tribulation. So I'm just trying to analyze what, what, what could it mean. They have to be something that they are first in, right? So, uh, because of the, the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, they were redeemed from among men. So, most likely, and I'm not saying this is definitive, right? It's most likely, just because we're trying to understand what he's saying about first fruits. That is, they're the first set of the Jewish people who were raptured, you know, they, they were taken up to God given the glorified bodies and taken up to God. In the middle of the tribulation, they are brought up into heaven. Possible. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is 100%. I'm just saying there has to be something special. What can make them different from the rest? Because, so, sorry? Other than this, no. Right. Because there is going to be a resurrection at the end of the tribulation. It's going, that's also going to happen. So if these people are you know, taken up into heaven, given the resurrected bodies now, then it's like first fruits. Like, okay, before others, they are the first. So in that sense. Okay. So this only analysis is only like, you know, I'm not saying this is... But, 100%. I'm just trying to explain. Right? Because, but there is a lot of question, you know, uh, how did this happen? They were redeemed from among men, being first first to God, and now they are before the throne of God. They are worshipping God. So these 144,000 Jews, right after the middle of the tribulation, are in heaven, and they are worshipping God. Then comes something very important, or very interesting. The rest of chapter 14, John is saying that there are going to be angels making announcements. Okay. God is going to do something at that time. This is right after the middle of the tribulation. There are going to be angels announcing to people about certain things. First, Revelation 14, 4. There's an, there's an angel. He is proclaiming the everlasting gospel to those who dwell on the earth. So, there's one angel. Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. He's proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Now, I'm just giving a side note here. There was a time in the 1980s, people were saying, oh, this angel is a satellite. Now, okay, it's a satellite going all over the world. It's proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Uh, because that time satellite television was a big thing and Christian TV was beamed through satellite to different parts of the world. So they're saying, oh, this satellite must be that angel flying in the midst of heaven, the everlasting gospel to preach all those. And he's saying, fear, you know, with a loud voice, fear God, uh, for the hour of judgment has come, worship the Lord and so on. So there, there used to be a time like this, that they say, oh, this angel must be a satellite proclaiming this. Now, I'll just leave it as, okay, there's an angel. I just leave it like that. 
uh, don't change the angel to a satellite and you know then a lot of other things can happen so leave it as an angel this god has assigned an angel to proclaim this verse 8 another angel is announcing something this angel is announcing the fall of babylon and we will see in coming up in chapter 17 and 18 there is the fall of babylon in chapter 17 there is a fall of babylon as this mystery babylon this world religious system chapter 18 there is a fall of babylon as in babylon representing the world economic system so two things we saw in chapter 13 that there are two things introduced by the false prophet and the antichrist or the antichrist and false prophet an economic system and a religious system Religious system, everybody must worship the beast. Economic system, you must take the number of the beast, only then you can buy and sell. And it's covering the earth. Chapter 17 and 18, both these things collapse. But now, in chapter 14, verse 8, angel is saying, it's going to collapse. Hey, don't, don't, don't believe, don't be a part of this. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city. Is fallen. It's announcing. It's going to fall. Another angel, verse 9, is telling people, don't receive the mark of the beast. Verse 9. So another angel is announcing, telling people, don't receive the mark of the beast. It's better to die than to receive the mark of the beast. Right. So basically saying, you know, this is the patience of the saints. You must, be you must have endurance. Verse 12. Keep the commandments of God and faith in Jesus. Don't receive the mark of the beast. Then, verse 13. Uh, there's a voice in heaven saying, Blessed are those who die in the Lord. Uh, so it's better to die in the Lord than to receive the mark of the beast. So, this is what's happening. Then, verse 14. John sees... And he sees a, a sickle ready. And an angel, verse 15, is coming and saying, Lord, put in your sickle for the harvest is come. So this sickle, verses 14 and 15, 14 to 16, is talking about a great harvest. So the sickle always represents a great harvest, harvest of souls. That's the only thing we can think of, harvest, harvest of souls. That means verses 14 to 16 is telling us at this time, there's going to be a, a lot of people who are turning to the Lord. A great harvest of souls. But at the same time, there's another picture, verses 17 to uh, 19. Another picture of a wine press. And the wine press... Um, he's saying you gather the grapes and you crush the grapes in the wrath of God. So the wine press represents the judgment, the wrath of God. So wine press means you cut all the grapes, you put it in a big uh, um, a container. And those days, people used to physically stamp on the grapes and crush it, like they'll walk on it. And they'll crush the grapes. So that's called the wine press. And they'll get the juice. But that was a symbol of judgment because you're being crushed. So that is a picture here. Uh, the wine of the earth, the grapes are there. And they're going to be thrown at the great wine press of the wrath of God. Verse 19. And then he says, verse 20, the wine press was trampled outside the city. That means outside Jerusalem. And blood came out up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. So about 180 some miles. Blood was flowing as high as five feet height. That means this angel is saying, there's going to be such judgment taking place outside the city of Jerusalem. Blood is going to flow like a river for about 180 miles, this high, five feet. So much blood is going to flow outside the city of Jerusalem. 
that is the kind of judgment that's going to or that's going to happen so two things are going to happen right there's going to be a great harvest and there's also a great judgment that is coming which will happen right there revelation 19 at the when the lord jesus returns and, and all the armies have gathered against jerusalem and the people are destroyed there's going to be this kind of judgment okay Um, sorry, Nina's question. Why do we say they are Jews? Um, sorry. Um, so, uh, Nina, in, in, in what context was this, Nina? The 144,000? Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you're say, referring to, oh, yeah, the 144. Yeah, the reason we say they are Jews is because of what we saw in, in uh, chapter 7, Revelation 7, that these 144 were selected from the tribes of Israel. Revelation 7, verse 4. I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. So that's why we say the 144,000 Jews, because Revelation 7, 4. They were these 144 were from the tribes of Israel. So that's these 144,000 Jews in Revelation 14, whom we see, whom we are seeing in heaven, uh, these 144,000 Jews. And so that's why we are saying these, because they are they be redeemed from men, but they were the first fruits. So the first set of people, the Jewish people, from the tribulation who have been resurrected or or you know, they had received the glorified bodies and they are raptured, taken up into heaven. Uh, that's what we're saying. And again, remember that uh, when we said about that first fruits, it's it's our best guess, all right? You know, we're analyzing and we're thinking. Uh, we, we're not saying it's conclusive, but they're the first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Okay. Yeah. So, Revelation 14, after these 144,000 Jews are in, in, taken into heaven, what else we are seeing? We are seeing three different angels making announcements to people on the earth. One is saying, believe the everlasting gospel. Another is saying, do not receive the mark of the beast. Um, sorry, uh, another is another's an announcing the fall of Babylon. And another is an saying, don't receive the mark of the beast. And then we are also seeing two other announcements. One is, there's going to be a great harvest of souls. And there's a great judgment coming. That's being announced. Yeah. So the way we can understand it is that all the there's going to be a great assembly of all the armies are going to gather against Jerusalem. So they're all coming to attack Jerusalem. And at that time, Revelation 19, people. So this will be a nations of the earth, armies from all the nations of the earth. So lots of people. You can imagine, you know, uh, I, we don't know exactly. I mean, some nations are mentioned in Ezekiel 38. We know, for example, Russia, Turkey, uh, Iran. Uh, Egypt is mentioned, uh, Ethiopia is mentioned, so certain nations, Arab nations are all mentioned. And obviously there will be a lot more, because we will see in Revelation 16, the kings of the east. That means oh, so many nations east of Israel are beginning to move. So, yeah, so all these nations, armies, of, so literally the people are mobilized. To go against Israel, uh, Jerusalem, and at that, so you know, let's say, let's say, I don't know for sure, but let's say, two hundred thousand, three hundred thousand, how many other thousands of soldiers are suddenly from all these opposing nations are all just landing there in uh, outside of Jerusalem, helicopters being dropped there from you know, aircrafts and just so you can imagine if there's this huge armies of people surrounding Jerusalem 
at that time. But that's there. That's Revelation 16. It says, I'll give you the exact verse here. Okay. Revelation 16. Right. Uh, verse 12. So the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So way for the kings of the east. That means kings means leaders. They, they, from the east, they're coming in against Israel. And he says, I see a frog. The dragons are going out. And what are these going to do? Verse 14. They're going to go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. It means demonic powers are released on the earth. And they are going to instigate the nations to come against Israel. That's what he's saying. So you can imagine so many people gathering, their soldiers, people coming against Israel. And at that time, you know, Revelation uh, 19, verses 15 and 16. You know, so when we're talking about this wine press, the same language is used here in Revelation 19, 15. It says, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he will strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with the rod of iron. He himself treads the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty. So wine press, Revelation 14, saying, hey, it's going to happen. Now oh, here it says, this is what's happening. Jesus, by the word of his mouth, this is how he's going to carry out that great judgment. Right? And Zechariah describes in Zechariah 14, he says, when these people are there, it's just like their flesh is going to disintegrate. I don't know how it's going to happen, but it says that. So just by the word of his mouth, it says here, going back to Revelation 14, 20, the blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridle, so 1,600 furlongs. So about 180 miles, blood is flowing. Oh, it's... So, the Antichrist will be on the Yes, he will be there at that time. So, are they fighting against the Antichrist? Coming to call, uh, he, he was in Temple and Israel. So, yeah, so what we, what we can, uh, let's say, I, I'm using the word guess, but um, we can understand is that there will be some nations who are going to, who are supporting Israel and there will be some nations who are against Israel so it's like a clash right but uh, antichrist is in the middle of this because he's the one who made the seven years of peace treaty he broke it in the middle and desecrated it. So it's given rise to this big confusion. And he's doing all this. So the nations are gathering against Israel. There will be, of course, Israel is going to defend itself. And there will be armies who are supporting Israel. And there will be armies who are coming against Israel. It's like, you know, war. And at that moment, the Lord is going to return. And if you think of it, even what you're seeing happen today, Uh, Israel is such a tiny country, and of course, you know what happened in, in uh, November seventh. Now, uh, you know the the Palestinians attacked, and now Israel is retaliating. That's been going on, but it's so much of tension in the Middle East because of this war that's going on. Or well, actually, Israel is retaliating and you know trying to doing this. Almost every day, you know, the news, okay, what's going on? What's going on there? Yeah. Israel and its neighbors. And uh, 
everybody's trying to calm things down, you know, make peace. But they have, have, they don't want this war to escalate and spread all over the Middle East. Other nations join in, it'll become a big thing. You know. Uh, but at that time, it's going to be very big. Right? Revelation. Okay, any questions? All right. So, Revelation 15, now we are getting ready for the bold judgment. So we've gone through seven seals, seven trumpets. We're getting ready for the seven last plagues. And uh, just before that, we're seeing there is, you know, there's worship in heaven happening. Uh, this is Revelation chapter 15. Um, there's worship in heaven happening. And things are getting ready for the seven bowls to be poured out. Then we come to Revelation 16. The seven bowls are being poured out. Our first bowl, the all, the all kinds of sores that affect the people who worship the beast and who worship his image. Revelation 16.2. Revelation 16.3. Uh, the second bowl affects, again, more, more of the seas, the waters. Third bowl, again, affects the waters, the rivers and springs. Uh, Revelation 16, verse 8. Fourth bowl. Um, men are uh, scorched with great heat and they blaspheme the name of God and they don't repent. Revelation 16, 10, uh, there is uh, darkness, the pain. Again, they're blaspheming the God of heaven. Re sixth bowl, Revelation 16, 12. This is where the river Euphrates is drying up to make way for the people, armies of, of the earth to begin to move towards Jerusalem. So this is where it's like, this is Revelation, Revelation 16, 12. The sixth bowl is, okay, this is where it's time for the battle of Armageddon, right? The, 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 the armies of the world are going to begin to move towards Israel. So, Revelation 16, 12, sixth bowl. It's coming to, to the end. Right? So, Revelation 16, 16, it says, They gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. So, that's why it's called the Battle of Armageddon, the final battle. So, they're all moving now towards Israel, so on. Right. Seventh bowl is, uh, this is it, the, the, the last one. Uh, the, the, the terrible things happening in the heavens above, on, on the earth beneath, earthquake and so on. Right. Now, Revelation 17 and 18 are interesting because remember, the nations are moving into battle getting ready for the battle of Armageddon. And then two things, two big things happen. Revelation 17, I'll just summarize this, but we will read this you know, verse by verse next year. This mystery Babylon. Now, mystery Babylon is referring to this religious system that was introduced by this false prophet. Suddenly falls. It, it is rejected. And uh, um, uh, people reject this false religion, right? and um, and uh, they they no longer uh, receive, or they no longer um, Subscribe to this religion. You see Revelation 17 verse 16. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be a one mind, and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So this mystery Babylon or this harlot is talking about this religious system 
that was introduced by this false prophet, suddenly these 10 rulers, 10 leaders who supported the Antichrist will turn against this religion. So we don't want this. Right? And uh, they will hate this harlot, this whole religious system. So it's almost like within themselves, they're dismantling the system. Revelation 18 is the fall of Babylon the Great. And, and here, when you read it, you'll understand that it is referring to the fall of the economic system. That literally in one hour, it says, the wealth of all the people of the earth is just going to go up in smoke. That means in one hour, all the wealth that they made just disappear. And this is so, so true, so possible in today's world. You know, that people invest and they put their money in different things and suddenly all that money is gone, disappear. It's like, it's almost like your, your value number zero. Your value was maybe millions of dollars and suddenly things have changed, your value is zero. Right? So that's Revelation 18, the fall of this. And you, you will see that, you know, uh, the, the, the merchants of the, of the nations, the people who put their money in, in one hour, everything has gone up in smoke. And uh, they, they, it's gone. So, Revelation 17, the fall of mystery Babylon, which is the religious system. Revelation 18, the fall of the city of Babylon, which is the economic system, is gone. Then, Revelation 19 is a scene in heaven. Heaven is, you know, heaven is like celebrating that the end has come and uh, uh, you know that, that the lord is is you know the lord is going to lord reigns revelation 19 7 there is a marriage supper of the lamb and then the second half of Revel uh, revelation 19 you see jesus coming from heaven he's coming to make war and all of us are coming with him the armies in heaven they're coming with him and he destroys the, the beast and the false prophet. Uh, so Revelation 19, 19. I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and the armies gathered together to make war against him, who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured with him, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, uh, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. So this is the battle of Armageddon. This is the end of the seven years of tribulation. The Lord Jesus comes and with his word he destroys all these armies, the beast and the false prophet are taken and cast into the lake of fire. And then that brings us to the end of this age, the end of the seven years of tribulation. Okay, so we're going to pause here. Any questions? Answers. Mm. Of Babylon, the same city of Babylon, yeah. the physical city. Oh, so um, the physical city of Babylon is in Iraq and When we read about, in Revelation 18, about that great city, Babylon, in Revelation 18, we see that it says that the business people from around the world, they are trading with this, or in this great city, Babylon. So literally, that does not, cannot happen. You know, Iraq itself is a, who are quite poor in its country. And it's not like nations of the world are trading with that. So 
the reason we are saying that this great city Babylon in Revelation 18 is referring to an economic system is because uh, merchants from all over the world, or traders from all over the world, are participating in it. Yeah, I mean, it's, some, it's something that is global. And uh, it is economic because they're buying and selling, they're selling their goods, all of those things. And they're participating in it. And in a moment, their wealth is gone. So we know that it doesn't have to do with uh, the physical, literal city of Babylon because that's not happening practically. That nobody's like, not the world, whole world is not trading with uh, Babylon as a city. Like if you say like okay maybe New York or if you say some you know some city or Singapore or some city where yeah there is a lot of global economic exchange happening yeah maybe but the way Revelation describes it is literally the nations of the world are trading in this and people are losing their wealth instantly so therefore because it cannot be with the literal city of Babylon. Uh, we therefore say it's very clear it's a it's an economic system and also because we see in Revelation 13 that this beast has set up a system where you cannot buy or sell unless you have the mark of the beast so we connect that yeah so this is what is happening and and uh, uh, the religious system which the false prophet set up and the economic system which the beast set up both have collapsed you know, so we can uh, we come to that conclusion, which I think is 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 logical. It's fair. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, let's take a break. Next week we'll continue with uh, chapter 20, 21, 22. We'll see what happens after the Battle of Armageddon. All right. Thank you, Ron. Let's close and um, we'll dismiss. Thank you.